Okay. Um, so um, uh, let me first introduce myself. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Maryland, and I'm, I, I have a few slides to quickly kick off some discussions related to uh, smart contracts. Okay, so um, it's very important, you know, to learn how to program smart contracts. In the future, this is going to be an, an our way of financial transactions. Uh, so at Maryland, we ask the undergraduate students in our security class to program uh, smart contracts, and this is a, a new Ethereum lab that we did. Um, uh, can everyone take, take a seat? And, and let, let me talk about some of the insights that we gained um, from this um, Ethereum lab. Uh, how <laughs> okay, so, so let me give some very quick overview of the lab. And the, the students worked in groups of four, and then uh, every group has a graduate uh, student advisor, which is one of my PhD students. And um, go forward, forward, forward. Okay, and, and then this, in the first phase, the students propose their idea, the application they want to um, develop, and then they, they build a prototype of the application, and then in the second phase, um, you know, we uh, critique each other's projects, and that the students made amendments um, to the problems we um, found out. Okay. Okay, next. Uh, so, so there's good news and there's bad news. Uh, I guess the good news is that this was a wonderful experience. Uh, all of us learned uh, tremendously, uh, including uh, the instructor and the TAs. Uh, and then the students also, they developed impressive and, and very creative applications. Uh, on the other hand, the bad news is, you know, Ethereum, as we know, the language is pretty much uh, evolving all the time. It's uh, in very much in development. And there's not a lot of documentation, so some students basically struggled to set things up um, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, so the students created a, a variety of applications over um, Ethereum, things like games, escrow services, auctions, parking meter applications, and stock market um, applications. Um, and this was very interesting. Uh, and then the, we learned some insights of, uh, with this lab. Um, one thing we learned is that programming smart contracts is really difficult. It's very hard to get things right. And so when we program traditional programs, you know, there are certain ways that you can mess up, but for the smart contracts, now there are more imaginative new ways that you can mess up and that are not necessarily applicable to a traditional programming. And so let me give you an example. Um, what I'm going to do is going to run through a very simple example and show you even to create such a very simple application is very challenging. Um, Okay, so to begin with, and the way to think about a smart contract, and so the smart contracts are going to be run uh, with um, all the miners in the distributed network. So if you trust that the cryptocurrency consensus protocol is secure, you can roughly think of um, the contract as being a trusted authority. Okay, um, and the users can send messages and send coins to the trusted uh, authority to this contract. The contract can store messages, it can store coins, and it can execute um, program um, logic. And so one thing to notice about this trusted authority is that every, um, every message sent to this trusted authority is in the clear, and all the data stored by this trusted authority is in the clear. So every, every participant can see all the messages. Um, all the states are stored on the blockchain, and the blockchain is public to everyone, and all the messages in the network is basically uh, passed around in this peer-to-peer -peer network. All right. So this is a trusted third party uh, with no privacy. And, and the very simple example I'm going to show is a rock, paper, scissors application. So think about um, two players. They want to play rock, paper, scissors, and they want to play this for money. Uh, there, we can write a very sim simple program that has three functions. The first function, add player, will register the players, uh, and, and where the players will deposit um, the money they use to play the game. And then the input phase is where the users indicate their choice of input to the smart contract, and the winner phase is where the contract selects uh, who wins and then gives the money to the winner. Okay, uh, and let's look at uh, some of the typical classes of mistakes uh, students made. Um, so here, um, this function implements add player, and it's very simple. Basically, um, the users will, uh, it, in order to participate in the game, a player would send uh, money, uh, in particular 1,000 ethers in this case, to the contract and the contract will register the public key of the user. Okay, so the, the contract in this case allows at most two players. So what is wrong with this very simple function? 
Uh, if you look at it more carefully, you'll realize that what happens if a third user tries to deposit money and register? In this case, the contract directly returns zero, and the money is not returned to this third player. So this creates um, a, a situation where the player's money can be leaked, basically. It goes into a, a black hole, and this third player doesn't actually get to play the game, and his money is lost. So if this is the contract you are dealing with, you have to be very, very careful because you, know, you, you don't know how many people are simultaneously sending money to the contract, and you definitely don't want to be this third player. Okay, it turns out that this class of mistakes is very common. It's um, basically corner cases in, in state machines, in co encoding state machines. Basically, the, the way you write these contracts is to encode a state machine to describe you know, where you are um, in the state machine, and then uh, as you encode more complex state machines, like some people develop more complex applications like auctions, and those involve a more complex state machine. And it's very easy to make mistakes when encoding these complex uh, state machines. All right. Okay, so here's an, so suppose you fix that, uh, and here's a second typical mistake that users and uh, students typically made. And in this case, the students are sending their inputs to the contract. So it's a very simple function that records the user's choice. And what is wrong with this function? Uh, if you look at it a little more carefully, essentially what happens is um, the inputs are sent in the clear to the contract. And this is bad because if uh, you and I are playing the game, uh, what makes sense for me is to wait for you to choose your inputs, and then I choose mine based on you play rock, I will play um, paper, right? Then, then, I, then I win. Okay. So how do you address this um, problem? Uh, essentially, you can use a standard cryptography primitive called commitment, uh, where you know, in the first phase, we both commit our inputs to the contract, and then in the second phase, we open our commitment, uh, and then the contract can decide who wins. And the commitment is supposed to be cryptographically hiding in the sense that it will hide our, hide our choices, and it's also supposed to be binding in the sense that when we open our commitments, we cannot change our inputs. Okay. So you'd think that just using crypto would uh, fix the problem, but things are actually nevertheless difficult. And this leads to the third class of um, mistakes that students typically make. Uh, so here, let's say we did the right thing and we did use crypto to implement the commitment. And so what is wrong with this um, um, little program here that tries to open the commitment? Okay, so the catch here is that and sometimes a player will have no incentive to open the commitment because let's say you open your commitment first and I see that you play uh, scissors. Okay, so my choice was uh, paper. And at this time, I know if I open my commitment, I would have lost. So what is incentive there for me to open my commitment? There is none. Uh, and basically by not opening my commitment, you know, I don't get any uh, money and, but then you, you lose as well, right? because you lost uh, the money you, you committed to the contract. Okay, so this is also a, a, another class of typical mistakes that students made. Essentially, the contracts they made were not incentive compatible. So there, there are cases where basically the players can manipulate and then uh, do bad things to other players. Okay. So solution, you can basically modify the incentive structure of the... Uh, um, this contract to make it incentive compatible. In this case, you can require the users to uh, deposit some additional money in order to play the game. And if they did open their commitments in time, this deposit will be returned to them. But if they fail to open their commitment, or if they open and the commitment didn't verify, the opening didn't verify, then they'd lose the deposit and the deposit would be paid out to this other player. Okay. So essentially, um, we are developing course materials um, for teaching how to um, program safe smart contracts. And then all of the stuff I talked about will be in a um, virtual machine uh, with a specific version of PY Ethereum installed. And um, so basically, uh, the, the next time, if you are going to teach a class like this, like um, you can minimize the student's effort at installing the software and so they don't have to go through this pain again. And then we will uh, give this step-by-step -step tutorial, starting with an example like this, and where we coach students how to fix uh, their smart contracts to create a, a safe smart contract. All right. Um, so please check back. There are some more subtle bugs, but um, I'm not going to uh, get into the details of those. 